Firstly, it's really great to, uh, to see you all and uh, be here in person. Um, unfortunately, uh, two of uh, the co-presenters could not be here for obvious reasons. Um, Will Callahan from Croydon Council, um, who is arguably the instigator of all of this, and, and John Waterworth from DXW, who are going to be presenting alongside myself, Finn Lewis from Adult Collective. Um, we've all been working on this project um, to share Drupal code with councils in the UK. Um, so, yeah, they send their apologies. Um, uh, oh, well, as mentioned, actually, just before, the, there is a link to the slides at the bottom there, bit.ly slash localgovdrupal, if anybody uh, wants to grab the slides. Um, so I'm Finn, Finn Lewis. Um, get me on Twitter or email me if you want to get in touch. I work for a company called Agile Collective. Um, we are a Drupal agency based in Oxford. We work with NGOs, non-profits, and public sector organisations, predominantly... Um, been going since 2011, and we're a worker co-op, so we're all co-owned, um, about 18 of us now, and we continue to, to grow slowly, organically. Um, feel free to get in touch if you've got any questions, or, um, in fact, also, if there's any questions during the talk, feel free to put your hand up and we can take them as we go. Um, so this project came about, our involvement in this project came about because of um, something called the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government, or the MHCLG, which I'd never heard of actually before, uh, before this project. But they funded um, a discovery phase um, with uh, a number of organisations, um, Brighton Hove City Council, Croydon Council, Oxford City Council and Bracknell Forest. Um, and that provided uh, funds for DFW and Agile Collective to get involved on the research and the technical discovery of um, how we can start to share Drupal code between, between councils. So it wouldn't have happened without the MHCLG. Um, that allowed us to put together a, uh, a decent team of people, albeit not very diverse people, um, which is something we're trying to work on for, for future phases. Um, but uh, Will Callahan, um, who would be covering this bit of the talk, uh, is, is really the, the instigator in this. Um, and uh, yeah, I suppose one other person to mention is Andrew Katz, who is a, uh, an amazing uh, open source lawyer uh, who came in uh, to help advise on that, which is uh, something that's very important in this world of collaboration and uh, public sector, especially getting people to understand it and, and get on board with open source. Um, so a little bit of history that, like I say, Will Callan would be, would be sharing with us at this point. Um, Will used to work with Brighton and Hove City Council, um, where Andy works um, now as a developer. And I'm um, uh, not sure, were you there at the time when Will was no, working there? Okay, so a couple of years ago, I think, um, he worked there for a year to help uh, Brighton and Hove put together a fantastic Drupal site on Drupal 8 um, with uh, lots of best practice, working with a design agency called Clearleft, I think, and Miggle as a Drupal development agency. Um, put together a great, you know, double A accessible. Um, Drupal 8 website, slightly ahead of the game when Drupal 8 was perhaps a little bit um, less mature than it is now. Um, and whilst doing those, so, they were regularly blogging about it, talking about sharing. I think the local digital de declaration had just occurred, something we'll talk about in a minute. And so they're already starting to think about how to share this with other, with other, other councils. Um, so much so that Will then posted a blog post uh, saying, is it time for local gov? Website as a service, you know, why are we building this again? Um, fast forward about a year and he moves to uh, Croydon Council, um, where Neil Williams, who used to be at uh, head of uh, GDS, Government Digital Services, is, is now um, heading up the digital section of Croydon Council, and said, can you come and help us build a website? 
Um, so with the connection between Brighton, um, we also said, hey, Brighton guys, can, can we use your code? Can we use what you do? Can we, you know, let's not reinvent the wheel here. And so the London Borough of Croydon website was uh, developed in a fraction of the time, around about a third of the time, saving a significant amount of time and money. Um, uh, and perhaps, you know, developing some of the code further. Do you know how much money saved? I've got a slide later oh, on, yeah, which sorry. does, does, no, it's fine. <laughs> um, uh, so it's about, I mean, in time it was about a third, I think it was about three or four months rather than 12 months. So, you know, uh, it's a massive, massive kind of saving. Um, depending on how you look at it, that could be that you've then got six months to do, or tw uh, eight months to do even more within the same budget, or you can look at it as a yeah. cost saving. So, but there's a bit of benefits um, okay, case com coming up a bit later. That's fine, please do interject at any point. This, uh, um, so yeah, cut a long story short, um, the work that had been done at Brighton & Hove facilitated Croydon doing it much quicker. Um, none of that could have happened without some key people, who I don't know who these are, but um, this is one of Will's slides, uh, but his point being that without key people in key positions of decision-making power and the will of, of those people, um, these kind of things won't happen. So you need you know, uh, people in procurement or people who are making decisions to actually understand that sharing code is a good thing and understand how open source can work. And so that, that was facilitated in this point, but in this case by a, a few key people. Um, moving on to this discovery phase, um, it's kicked off with a problem statement. Um, which was how can we help councils co-develop, share and maintain open source Drupal code for their citizen facing website. Now originally it was a bit wider than that, it was like how can we do open source code, but um, the MXCLG who were funding it said well, well let's focus on something tangible and you know, you've got Drupal code, let's just do Drupal at the moment. So it has scope to go wider later but we're definitely just focusing on, on the Drupal. Um, a quick slide just on the kind of potential scope of this, um, which I thought I'd put in here, it also comes in later. But just looking at CMS usage by councils, um, Drupal comes in at number two, at about 61 out of 400 ish councils in, uh, in the UK, just behind Jardi, which is a proprietary CMS. So there are 60 odd councils using Drupal already, Drupal 7 and 8, and that's very much the kind of target audience for this um, you know, uh, potential collaboration. Um, but there's a lot of other councils out there who are using other systems who might well benefit from it later. So there's, there's a, you know, this kind of scope of the benefit is, is kind of highlighted with that. Um, having said that, we spoke to only about 10 councils who were already within that kind of 60 councils, so there were people who were already using Drupal. And there was a lot of um, discussion, interviews, and, um, and calls with, with developers and product managers from these councils, which we'll talk a little bit about now. Um, three questions that we talked to them about. How do they build and operate and maintain their websites? Um, what do they know about the existing code sharing that's going on between Brighton and Croydon? Because a lot of them did, they've been following the blog posts. And how might collaboration work for them? So this is very much the research phase, which um, would be being talked about by John Waterworth, where he here, but he unfortunately cannot be here. Hi, no worries, come in. Um, shall I just start again? <laughs> No. Um, the slides are online if you want them. They're at bit.ly slash local gov people. So if you want to get the slides, you can catch up. Okay. Um, but this is, a, this is a bit just on the research phase, um, talking to councils and, and seeing what we, what we found, some key points. Um, firstly, councils find it hard to continue to improve their websites. They've got much more limited budget these days. Um, they're under pressure to improve their services. Um, and they feel it's wasteful, this kind of procurement every three to five years, going through a massive procurement phase getting new websites, sometimes it's proprietary, sometimes it isn't, and they feel that you know, the whole thing is kind of, um, it's been done a few times now in most councils, so that's, that's certainly uh, uh, something that they're finding difficult. Um, they have common problems. Lots of councils like to think they're unique, but, I mean, like, you know, my council's got different colour bins from the neighbouring council, it's quite weird, um, but we all need the same things from our council. We need bin services, we need uh, roads to be serviced, we need to be able to uh, apply for a blue badge. Um, you know, citizens have common needs. Um, but they also, most of the councils that we spoke to seem to be, you know, value being part of a, a community that can share ideas and experience as well as code. So not just, let's have a Drupal site, but how did you decide to do that? And what kind of user research have you done around that? So sharing knowledge, ideas, and, and that sort of stuff. Um, finding three. Open source, I just realised I could look at this screen rather than that. Which is, which is <laughs> <possible>. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, open source and Drupal in particular can work well for councils. Um, something that that was perhaps surprising. Um, there is still some distrust in open source in councils and uh, the kind of procurement level of uh, you know where what size sort of guarantee and warranty and that kind of you know, the kind of stuff that doesn't come with an open source project that would with a proprietary. But thirty percent of councils are using an open source platform already, which is great, and I'd like to see that grow personally. But um, uh, yeah, and Drupal is seen as an, an exemplar, and um, as we've seen, you know, it's the second, well, it's the biggest open source uh, and the second biggest uh, website CMS. Um, fourth finding from, from the research, code sharing can work for councils with different starting points and different levels of capability. Right, yeah, so some councils might want to take on a complete code base, some councils might just want a little thing like a directories or a step-by-step -step or some of the design or some of the research. So um, some of them have in-house development capabilities such as Brighton and Hove and Croydon. Um, some don't have any, like Oxford City Council, for example. Um, but all of, the, all of the councils we spoke to that didn't have any felt confident that they could buy in services to help with Drupal development should they need it. Um, so as I mentioned, they may be quite a self-selecting group of councils because they were already aware of the Drupal. Um, so there may be scope to extend that you know, to, to other councils later who maybe don't know so much about, about the development. Fifth finding of the research, and then we'll move on to other stuff. Um, councils expect a piece of paper, something to sign. They're like, yeah, what, what is this agreement? You know, what are we getting involved in if we want to start sharing? We we'll like the idea of it, but, um, but we, need, we need to kind of sign something, you know, have some kind of agreement. There's something called the Local Digital Declaration, which is a set of uh, values that people are signing up to. Um, but it's not specific around the kind of how to how to collaborate. Um, I'll talk about a bit about that in, in, in a minute. Um, but something simple that doesn't necessarily ask for money because that triggers procurement and can, can be a barrier to adoption. And something that's simple and transparent and everybody can see. So again, pointing towards working in the open. Um, and I think at this point it's worth mentioning the digital local digital declaration. Um, has anyone heard of this? No, nobody. I haven't heard of this. You must have heard of this. <laughs> you don't count. Um, but uh, I haven't heard of this before, but a couple of years ago, the, ministry for, the MHCLG Ministry for Housing, Communities and Local Government set up this local digital declaration, um, which is all around you know, collaborating between local government, sharing ideas, sharing best practices, and you know, not reinventing wheels, um, and goes on to, to have this phrase, this, this important statement, where, where appropriate, every new IT solution must operate according to technology code of practice, putting us in control of our service data, using open standards where they exist, and contributing to their creation where they don't. Now, the technology code of practice is what's interesting. Um, that's coming off govd.uk, and if you follow the links through, you end up on this code of practice, which then links through to saying, be open and use open source. So around being open, publishing open source, um, you know, it's kind of like embedded within this, this uh, local digital declaration. So that's something that kind of really sort of framed the whole project and um, and continued to kind of like feed into uh, to, to, you know to the ideas of working in the open that, that this is this is stuff we need to do. Um, it's interesting. If, yeah, go and have a look at the local digital declaration because it has got some interesting stuff. And I think I'm not sure, maybe a couple of hundred of councils have signed up to it to say we will do this, but perhaps without really knowing what that means. So. So, but, but yeah, we'll see. Switching forces. This is another one of John's slides, which illustrates that there are some things that push people um, towards, you know, uh, perhaps sharing code and doing things in a different way. Other things that pull organisations, um, stopping reinventing the wheel, you know, multiplying the development effort. You know, if one, if you can have some, you know, two developers at Brighton can be working on a bit of code, which actually two developers in Oxford are also working on. We can get more, more development capacity by collaborating. Um, and some other things that pull back, like inertia uh, around your own resources or limited capabilities, and a bit of anxiety around the distrust of, of open source, or will we need to support it all ourselves. Um, nothing insurmountable, but worth acknowledging all the same. This slide is around adoption paths for councils, acknowledging that some people are on Google, some people are not. Some people have got an OK website, some people haven't. And we, we're not really initially typing people who've got an OK website who are not on Drupal, because that's kind of you know, a bit further off. But there's lots of people who are on Drupal 
maybe we need to upgrade from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8, we'll be very interested in maybe you know, uh, adopting the complete code base. However, there are some people who may be happy with their Drupal 8 code base and just want to take certain components. So different needs from different councils need to be considered. So that was the research kind of section of our, of our discovery phase. The next piece in the puzzle was looking at the technical side of uh, what's possible based on the code base that Brighton and Hove City Council and Quinn. So is that what it stands for? Brighton and Hove City Council, the CC. Yes. Yeah, just stand up like <laughs> Needed to check that. Um, and Coyden, uh, London Borough of Coyden currently share. So that leads us. Sorry, are they both unitary councils? Are they? Uh, Brighton is a unitary council, uh, Coyden's a uh, London Borough. So oh, yeah, that's. So so that could, yeah, so they sort of. Oh, London Borough is a sort of unitary council. Yeah. I think so. I think they're kind of the same type of council in that yeah, way. So, the <laughs> so their needs are very similar. Yeah, this is something that came up. We did speak to district councils and city councils, and, you know. In Oxford, we've got county council and the city council, and, and so um, no, I've just that's been given a brief on a local district cabinet uh, digital person to look at redoing their website. Let's talk about it. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. So, I mean, there's a lot of people out there who are in yeah. the process of doing websites or about to start doing websites, and so yeah. this is the time to start collaborating um, actively. Um, so. As part of our technical discovery work, it's just worth mentioning some of the great things that these websites have got. Um, you know, there's a lot of sort of commonality in terms of um, how people land on the homepage and want to get through to a particular service. Um, there's a lot of uh, thought gone into um, common design components, a lot of it leading from the gov.uk best practices. Um, a lot of people will be familiar with, um, with gov.uk's design system. So. The original design that kind of came out of the Brighton & Hove website, which was then inherited by, by the Coyden, you know, largely was influenced by this design system, um, which includes styles, components, and patterns. Um, and this is, I, I guess, really at the heart of why a lot of time and effort can be saved, because a lot of money went into doing user research to find these patterns and to look at evidence-based design decisions, essentially, what works well for people. Um, and so rather than reinventing wheels at the local level, we use the components that make sense. Um, so a couple of things, obviously, you know, a button, it looks like a simple thing, but the reason that's designed in that way is based on evidence and based on testing. And so let's follow that, you know, maybe it doesn't, maybe it doesn't have to be green, but maybe, you know, uh, so I think, I'm pretty sure the Brighton and Hove buttons look pretty similar to that, maybe a slightly different color. But following, following that, that, that pattern, again, step by step is a, is a classic um, design pattern that, that we've seen in, um, in government. If you have gone, you know, sort of renewed a passport or, or something along those lines, or in this case, learn to drive, you'll, you'll have your kind of step by step process, you'll be able to see where you're at. And um, this is illustrated, in this case, on the Croydon site by a bunch of Drupal configuration and theming and, and custom code to essentially replicate that GovUK pattern. Uh, in a, you know, content types and related configuration, along with with uh, the sort of component size buttons at the bottom. So taking all of this knowledge, you know, embedding it into into the websites, and then you know, sharing that, not reinventing the wheels again, is, is kind of the essence. So there's lots of really great work that's gone on Brighton and Hove and uh, and Croydon. Um, directories being another one, um, something off the Brighton and Hove website common to all councils, you know, they'll need to find things in your local area, in this case special educational needs and disability support. Um, a reasonable amount of, you know, complexity of configuration and, and uh, you know, can be saved by just bundling that up, hopefully without too many dependencies and, and passing it over. So that said, I just wanted to kind of give it a sort of overview of the value that we've got in these websites that we can potentially, you know, um, uh, share essentially with each other, uh, each other being you know local authorities. That said, we focused, focused on three important questions because we like threes. Um, is the code shareable? What's the proposed architecture going forward, and how do we manage and scale that kind of contribution um, in a collaborative environment? So, taking the first one, as you may imagine, we had to look at the code and the content architecture. We talked to the developers from Brighton and Hove and from Croydon and worked out you know, how they were feeling about different aspects and, and you know, whether we were understanding it correctly. And then we came up with some recommendations, as you might expect. There's quite a lot of code. Um, this is just a screenshot of, of some of the shared modules that are, you know, I think there's about 30 odd modules that are shared between, you know, custom modules that are shared between the, the two 
um, two sites and about 80 contrib modules or so. First thing, the code is generally well written, which is you know good, but it's not really written for sharing, as you you know you might expect. Um, I guess we'll come on to why in a moment. Um, the dependencies really uh, is what needs untangling. Back to that idea that we want to be able to you know break out directories or break out a little component and be able to use that separately. We really you know some people aren't going to want to use everything. So if we're going to be sharing, we need to untangle some of the dependencies. I mean this is. Uh, looking at the kind of content dependency chain, uh, where the purple boxes are content types, and then TTT reference were illustrated by lines, um, along with taxonomy terms and paragraph types and other things. There's a lot of interdependencies going on, which I think you know, evolved in that way, because that seemed like the, uh, a good way to do it. But if we want to break some of these things up, we need to work out how to deal with those dependencies. So, um, and that's not even at a code level. Um, so yeah, proposed architecture, as you may expect, um, a Drupal distribution, um, including a Drupal core, which you probably need, a local gov core, and uh, some optional modules. But that, again, this is just an illustration of that for sort of visual uh, purposes. Um, these slides were originally used to, to present back to the MXCRG to kind of give them an idea. I guess we're maybe in some ways preaching to convert it here, but is anyone, is, is anyone not familiar with Drupal distributions as a concept? No, everyone is great. So, so yeah, lots of stuff in, in the sort of core of the distribution and lots of stuff that's optional that can depend on the distribution. But again, it's all about dependencies, right? It's all about trying to, so like if that's directories up there, can I just take directories and use it separately from the distribution? Or can I take it with one of these modules that it depends on? And, you know, try and make it much more reusable, much more, much more modular. Um, so yeah, I kind of following on from that, that's kind of what I just said, really. We need to make changes to the content architecture um, to remove the unnecessary dependencies and make it fully modular. Uh, we also need to make changes to the code, because there's a lot of it. And again, it's got the same kind of like interdependencies within the code that have essentially evolved around the, the interdependencies of, of the content. Um, so these are our kind of recommendations, essentially based on reviewing the technical, uh, re reviewing the code and the configuration. Um, so, to avoid increasing future uh, technical debt, um, those things I've just said, and then, yeah, adhering to best practices in, in Drupal coding standards, um, which kind of comes on to how to manage and scale the contribution. Um, at this stage, it's kind of, you know, a couple of developers at Bright and a couple of developers at Croydon working together, kind of, you know, working on their own and coming together in a sort of ad hoc you know, sort of handshake uh, arrangement. But I think going, going forward, it's kind of clear that we need to codify that, um, you know, be really clear about um, you know, adopting contribution guidelines as we know and love in the Drupal community, um, and really kind of like establishing those in, in any of the, uh, the developers who are going to be working together on a, on a shared project. So yeah, clear expectations, how you contribute, um, expectations around peer review of, of anything that's being contributed, coding standards, documentation, um, and automated testing. Uh, this kind of taps, in, taps into the sort of fear that comes from some of the council, uh, you know, councils that are, that are kind of like, well, if we get into this, then you know, what, what about how do we know it's going to be good quality? How do we know that um, that what we're getting back from other contributors is going to is going to um, is going to not break our site? Um, and so, obviously, automated testing is key. Um, and following on from the kind of values that we talked about and working the open, being open source, if we can have a fully open source project, people like GitLab provide testing for free, like up to, I think, 50,000 hours of testing a month or something like that. Just announce they're scaling that back, but anyway. Oh, quick, sign up now! <laughs> so Stephen says they're just announced they're scaling that back. But anyway, there, you know, there is uh, open source uh, testing stuff out there for free, which is, which is great. Um, um, so, to summarise, we want to build on the great work that's been to date, but re architect it to be more shareable and you know, automate as much as stuff as possible. So, that's the kind of like technical review um, of what we've got and where we're going. Um, governance and licensing was another strand of the work. So, uh, and th this is kind of key, obviously. Um, Aaron, who's the colleague at Agile Collective, uh, sort of led on this along with Andrew Katz, who's the um, uh, open source lawyer from Moorcrofts, um, and he looked at three important questions. 
as we do. Um, what's the most appropriate model? Um, as in the model of governance, but also the licensing models. Um, how can we? Or how can organisations join, uh, contribute, and leave? So this idea that there's a group, there's a thing that we're going to join and, and leave, and what does that mean? Um, and how might we take decisions? Um, so let's just look at what he said. Um, we researched the governance and licensing of similar projects, and then we discussed and uh, agreed what was good enough for now. Um, there is a link there to, I think, some comparisons of open source models. But we did look at the Node.js Foundation, the Apache Foundation, and the Aperta Foundation, which is a, a healthcare foundation around sharing open source. And they all have slightly different but very interesting uh, methods of governance. Um, looking at that and combining it with the research, we found that there's no need for a formally incorporated body at the stage. So not like a foundation or, or a company that's going to kind of own this and take this forward, um, that would be somewhat of a blocker to, to getting involved, it would involve finance and complexities. Um, instead, uh, uh, an agreement, that's a memorandum of, of understanding, not association, um, something lightweight that people can read, understand and, and sign up to that defines what it is that we're doing and why. Um, and our third conclusion on that front was that licensing models are complicated, or can be complicated. Um, Andrew Katz knows a lot about licensing and gave us lots of options and we looked through uh, various you know, models that, that may be, but I think it came back down to the fact that we want to work in the open, we're working with open source software that's GPL in the first place, and if we can publish it, it makes sense to follow the GPL route. Um, so it, you know, it became clear that that was the, the, definitely the path of least resistance. Um, not to say that there might not be other licensing models in the future that are compatible with GPL if, if that needs to happen. Um, so how can organisations join? Like I said, the MOU kind of defines that. The MOU covers these things. That's a kind of screenshot of it. There's a link to it there if you want to have a look. Um, purpose, values, IP and licensing. Liability, which is a, a, you know, potentially sometimes an issue. Um, governance, joining and leaving, and commitments of time and money. Um, at this stage, we're not talking about any kind of commitment of money because that just keeps it simple. We're just talking about potentially people committing time to a group. Um, and agreeing on, on what you know what's going to happen with that with that time. So I just touch on a couple of these. Um, it's really bless you. It's really important to define the purpose of the group. Um, so I just kind of read this one out. You know, the, the purpose is to establish and grow an active group of councils to co-develop, share, and maintain open source Drupal code for our citizen-facing websites. So just really limiting it down to citizen-facing websites, which is kind of publishing, not even the transactional stuff where people come and fill forms in, but just, just the publishing of, of, of content for now, um, and, and specifically Drupal. So really just being clear what, what it is that people are signing up to. The values, uh, this all comes from the local digital declaration, which, um, you know, I'm pulling those things out, open culture, working in the open, sharing of knowledge and experience, um, reusing as much as possible, and, uh, and yeah, publishing everything under open source licenses. Um, like I said, the, the MOU, the, the MOU is a, it's a proposed MOU that we're going to test, hopefully, in an in a alpha stage. But it's gone down well so far. Um, we had comments like, I don't think I've ever enjoyed reading an MOU before, but I did this time. <laughs> um, and, uh, and a very good doc. I like that it's concise. So this is, you know, these are coming from councils, and this is positive, positive sounds. Um, but hopefully we're setting up something that's lightweight enough but specific enough to actually you know, uh, go forward. The more thorny question of how we make decisions is something that's going to, you know, um, yeah, it's going to be interesting to, to test, essentially. All of this is kind of proposals for testing, by the way, I should underline that. So we looked at decision-making processes in other open source projects and modelled how we might grow as a group. Because we're talking about four councils initially, maybe eight to ten in a sort of alpha phase, and then, what, 20, 50? All with product managers and developers, and you know how we how we make decisions. Which what's, which way is the roadmap going? What, what's the most important feature to develop next? And, um, so we proposed a sort of combined approach, acknowledging there are different levels of decision making. For important decisions, um, consensus seeking is a is a good decision making model. Um, basically, trying to get everybody to agree. Um, as a kind of vote, yes, no, abstain to a proposal. But no votes must have a clear reason for no and or an alternative proposal to, to you know, be a constructive no, essentially. Um, and then a fallback onto a majority vote if that fails. 
Um, and what has been seen in other organisations like the Node.js Foundation is that that rarely ever gets to that point. The, the, so having the backstop of the majority vote means that people can find agreement much, much easier and better. And they don't tend to kind of block block decisions without you know really thinking about why it is they're blocking it. So for that's when like important decisions like changes to the MOU, like the fact that we're going to stop using Drupal and use WordPress or those kind of things. Um, for more you know, day-to-day -day decisions that may be le less risky and less, you know, less impact. Um, lazy consensus is seems to be um, a nice way to facilitate people to, to crack on with work. Um, you know, announce that you intend to do something, allow time for any objections to be raised, and if no one does, crack on. So for things like, you know, commits to to uh, to make, commits to code repositories in the Node.js foundation, I think they use this. They kind of leave a period of 72 hours before, while reviewers can, can check. You know, anyone can object to something being committed. If they don't, it just goes on and you know, gets committed. So a way to facilitate um, action, essentially. So to summarise, being open and transparent and collaboration is important, but not at the expense of empowering people to do work. So that you know, assumption that stuff's going to happen... Um, but, you know, being able to challenge it um, if needed. So, benefits case that I mentioned we get on to. So, um, Will Callahan, um, formerly of Brighton & Hove, now at Croydon, um, would have been presenting this section. But back to the distribution of CMSs in, council, uh, in the UK, um, there's clearly benefit to 61 councils who are using Drupal if they start to collaborate on uh, more on Drupal code rather than reinventing bits of it, um, both just on sharing code and also sharing best practices. There's also a massive potential you know, to people who are not using Drupal yet, but potentially trying to push Drupal uh, up that side of the curve. Um, what did he say here? Potential t uh, time and money savings. So yeah, launching new council sites more quickly, building fewer standalone micro sites. Um, reducing unnecessary customer content and sharing knowledge and skills makes us better. Uh, I guess it is what it says. Um, so I think, it, yeah, we just touch on a few of these here. So um, forgive me. Go on. Sorry. Question? Should that be customer content rather than custom content? Or contact? Contact. So unnecessary. Wait, I'll come on to that in one sec. Because um, I think there is a side. Uh, yeah, so. Um, Customer, I'll go that way. Customer contact is you know people phoning up or uh, coming in to try and find information which could otherwise be no, delivered on the website. Be custom contact. Yeah. So, so anecdotally, you know, improved website reduces the amount of customer contact, which saves money, um, but it's very difficult to measure that. It'd be really good to try and measure that at some point because um, that's all about channel shift, get people to stop phoning up and just finding the information on the website and. Um, we haven't got any kind of figures on that, but um, what Will has prepared some figures on is um, looking at how much might be saved uh, in, in you know, broad strokes. Um, looking at different council types, people are switching from off-the-shelf solutions to Drupal, and that's be looking at saving you know, 65,016 grand a year, based on a couple of examples. People looking to do a one-off build or with an in-house team, or with using an agency and some, some assumptions, figures which we think are quite conservative. Um, Tightly leads up assuming there was 55 councils who might be doing this. We're looking at figures of you know a few million pounds, um, probably over a few years, maybe three, four years, depending on what your kind of life cycle, you know, expected lifetime of a, of a website is. Um, but uh, but again, hard to be accurate and specific. Um, but broad strokes, we you know does seem to be there's potential. And if you scale that out from 55 councils to hundreds of councils, I mean, you know, we're talking about um, serious, serious potential savings. Um, sorry, do you want to... <laughs> I hate it when people do that, right? When you're just, you're just about to take a photo and they skip the slide to the next one. Um, the slides are available on bit.ly slash localgovdoople if you want them as well. Um, so microsites, microsites. So every council needs microsites, apparently. They've got a new thing, the new co branded campaign going on. They can't do it on their own website. It needs to look a bit different. It's got slightly different content. Um, some interesting things around accessibility testing, often costing, you know, increasingly costing a bit of money, and penetration testing costing quite a lot of money. Whenever a new, you know, let's just get another microsite. Oh, that needs to go through pen testing and other stuff. So there's, there's costs in, involved there, which could be saved by having microsites on your main Drupal site or even spun up as part of the 
a, a distribution that um, that you already know is past you know penetration testing and accessibility testing, um, and potentially saving on design and dev time if if you can persuade those people that you don't need to do any different design. Um, I know Brighton Hove and Croydon have got kind of campaigns pages now, which are sort of much more. Um, Flexible in terms of content and branding and co-branding, and uh, that's the kind of like microsite killer idea, which could potentially save you know, again millions of pounds across a number of of councils. Um, but yeah, to, to be to be seen. I mentioned the channel shift idea around you know reducing customer contact is very difficult to measure, but um, but we will try to. So. Apparently, every good collaboration needs a mission patch, um, which is which is also known as, as well. Yeah, I don't, I've never heard that phrase before. This project, either I'm learning a lot on this project. Um, but at some point on a call, I was pictured wearing a fun hat. Uh, you know, I'd like to keep things fun in the office. I didn't know somebody was taking a photo of me at the time, but um, uh, it, it was a productive call. But that's led to uh, the mission patch having a a nice drooper con with a, uh, a cowboy hat. Pink cowboy hat and the Duke So stickers have been made. Unfortunately, I don't have any with me today, but um, stickers have been made and, and sent to us to um, celebrate the, the discovery phase that, uh, that finished last Tuesday. Um, so that's all good and fun. Um, it makes it all worthwhile. Next steps is an alpha phase. So these phases are coming off um, sort of government, GDS kind of like recommended phases for, for services that are developed, you know, kind of like discovery, alpha, beta, and then live or launch or whatever. Um, and MHCLG's funding is linked to these phases. So we've had funding for the discovery phase. The next phase is an alpha phase where we're going to be testing a lot of some of this stuff. So do a bunch of refactoring on the code and the theme to make it much more shareable and modular. And testing some of these concepts around, you know, flexibility of the code with the councils, get some other developers involved and start to see how we collaborate. Um, test the MOU and the licensing proposition. Will people sign up to this? Can we <coughs> scale this out to 10 councils? Um, and you know, have collaboration sessions, have people in sort of sprint planning, sprint review, you know, working together, maybe different levels of resource from different councils and see how that actually really works. And you know, hopefully through doing so, help some particular councils get on board with, with, uh, with this code. Um, and yeah, promoting to other councils, so setting up a I think it's shop window, as it were, you know, a website or, or maybe somewhere where it's clear, clearly documented how you get involved and how you, how you crack on. Um, so, councils that are going to be involved in the alpha phase include extensions to Cumbria Council, Westminster, London Councils, which is a kind of group of councils, quite, um, and Kensington and Chelsea. Uh, alongside the, the original three, although we're not sure whether Oxford City is is, uh, is involved in the alpha phase anymore. And um, I think yesterday these guys just posted something on their website saying that they have approved funding for an alpha phase to Croydon for, for the project, which is really exciting. Um, so yeah, props goes out to the Ministry of Housing and Communities Local Government for actually having money and putting it down and saying open source is a really good thing to do go on, carry on, explore it, test it, try it, prove that it works, you know, because that's really going to, you know, facilitate creating uh, an amazing distribution. So hopefully off the back of that, we take what Croydon's got, the evolution from Brighton to Croydon, break it up into, you know, local gov core and components and make it reusable and, you know, really, really start to build that. Obviously, custom theme on top of that is a, is a next layer, you know. Do we have a base theme which has a bunch of assumptions? Can we actually take it to the point where a council with no developers at all can point and click their way to a sort of low-code website and replace the logo, replace the colours and actually have pretty much what they need for a fraction of the cost. Um, that's probably a bit further off, but that's certainly part of the vision. It sounds like that's doable, though, because you were talking about the button themes before. Exactly. So, so you know, have the componentizing the theme down to the, the, the component level and sort of atomic or molecular, whatever the, the design yeah. terms are these days. Um, and you know, having variable variables for colours and such, and you know, actually having yeah, following GDS patterns with some local golf patterns, even you know, evolving uh, and yeah, sharing it, sharing it at that level. One thing I'm really excited about is collaborating with other distributions. So part of this project has been um, looking at some other distributions and seeing how they do things, 
Drupal 8 distributions, obviously, you know, uh, sort of not quite as far ahead as Drupal 7 distributions, but Drupal 8 really enables distributions to happen in a, in a much more um, scalable and, and modular way, I think. Um, Lightning, Thunder, um, Lightning being Acquia, sort of starter kit, Thunder being a publishing um, distribution, which is uh, amazing. Open Social being a more sort of Facebooky type community distribution. Varbase kind of does everything, as far as I can tell. <laughs> um, and opinion is an e-learning platform. But they're all distributions doing different things. And I was, I was speaking to a guy from Thunder yesterday who was really excited about sharing what they do. Um, they've got six full-time developers at Berda Media Group, is it, in, in Germany. And it's very focused on you know media publishing, that kind of stuff. It doesn't really have any front end. It's just all about the editing experience. Um, but a lot of the same problems. They've got multiple stakeholders, multiple product managers, multiple people wanting different things and how they actually navigate that and prioritise um, how much effort they put on automated testing. So I think there's a massive scope to learn from other distributions and for distributions to start talking to each other. I mean, they probably already do, but I'd just like to get involved in those discussions. Um, and that's really exciting. But also, you know, people who are also, like you say, got a local council who's come to them for a website, like, let's talk about the distribution together, get more people plugged into it, more developers, more of the community, and more councils, I think. Um, so that's exciting. So yeah, that's it, really. Thanks for listening. Um, you can follow, well, you can find me on Twitter, and that's up on Twitter. Will, you couldn't be here today, uh, Will Goff on Twitter, quite, quite chatty, and DXW on Twitter. Um, and there's a local Gov Drupal digital Slack channel, I, I believe. Um, not that I've been there. So yeah, any... Questions or suggestions? Well, yeah, I'm just How do we get involved? How do we get involved? Um, so I'm Alden Forest. I'd okay. love to get involved in this project. Um, I think probably Will yeah. at Hoyland is the best kind of. I mean, you know, talk to me and give me yeah. contact details, but I think yeah, definitely get in touch with him because he's gathering more councils to try and right. test with the alpha and see where they're at and, you know, um, yeah, get more people involved, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Um, one of the biggest bugbears in my district council is finding planning applications because the search, the system they've got, makes searching for planning applications almost impossible. Because um, you've got to know the week that the planning application is actually processed, yeah. <laughs> which is absolutely impossible for people to know unless they've been told by the developer or something. Absolutely, like that. yeah. So at the moment, Does this solve, has this been involved? So at the moment, this is very much just councils publishing content onto their website. Right. Not a thing out now. It's got once we have established the mechanism to share thinking code and you know have have that kind of collaboration mechanism proven that it's scalable across more than just two councils. And, you know, then the next thing comes in, right? Yep. Can we then start doing a system that solves that because everyone's got the same problem? What about forms? I know Brighton and Hove are using Drupal web forms as the front end to all of their forms, and then plugging that into APIs to go to a particular form engine behind it. Another potential, you know, sort of integrations with more complex systems, where perhaps I don't know, thirty percent of the councils are using the same form system, but they could have something else that front ends it and makes it much easier, more accessible, or whatever else. You know, the workflow stuff's dealt with that side of the front end. So yeah, absolutely, that's a potential future, right? But mm. in order to get this thing off the ground. They very wisely focus just on the publishing of content. Have you um, also looked at the way that uh, police constabulary is for sharing group code? Uh, no, that was mentioned to me by Gareth earlier. So Suffolk, yeah. con Suffolk constabulary, uh, Essex constabulary, uh, I think Essex, but certainly Norfolk are using the same group code just re theming it yeah. for their own county. But that's not publicly available, and they're not... I, I, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to find out who did it. <laughs> uh, I think, sorry, was it Gareth or... Um, no, I'll point you to a guy earlier who's talking yeah. about that. I think he knows more about that, but yeah. Uh, I think, again, I think it was quite fascinating that they, um, they, they've all got the same requirements. And then there's schools, right? And like you were saying, I think like, so there's lots of other scope for similar requirements of Drupal distributions that could yeah. scale out, you know, and I think... As Dries has often said, um, Drupal distributions are really, you know, important in getting people on board with Drupal and solving particular problems. And uh, you know, yeah, yes. So, uh, two things. First, thanks for name checking Michael, whom I used to work for. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah. Um, although I never worked on DHCC. Um, you mentioned uh, distributions just now. In my limited experience as a site builder working with distributions, I often spent half my time 
trying to turn off or bypass a whole lot of assumptions which I actually didn't want within it. Mm. Um, and I suppose you're not at a, a status right now where that's actually a real problem, but it just struck me as something to potentially worry about or think about in the process. It definitely is. I mean, you know, even embedded in that kind of rapidly put together image of um, what local gov core might include, yeah. there's massive assumptions around uh, there's only a standard page and a blank page, and then the, the service pages, the idea that all councils provide services and they need to promote services, what do they mean by services, like you, know, you can come and I don't know, get your parking permits and get your free badge, whatever. So they call them services, right? Yeah. And yeah. embedding that core seems absolutely logical to everyone involved, but who knows whether these assumptions will then actually tie us up in the future. So where to draw that line, right? How where to draw the kind of like baseline of, of opinions and assumptions. But um, a distribution is opinionated, that's the point, right? It makes a lot of, it has opinions, it makes assumptions in order to save you time. Yeah. As long as it's really clear about what they are, and hopefully makes it modular enough that you could potentially use some of that without some of that, then yeah, that's where I think that's the art of creating a sustainable architecture for a distribution, which, uh, which we'll see where we get to, I think we'll see as we go. This is just based off the assumptions that you know, we found from, from talking. Um, but yeah, that's it. it's, a really, it's a really good point and a really important question. Just following on from that, really, what, what conversations have been had about configuration management in terms of, uh, you know, a, a basic, a essential configuration for the distribution and then allowing for third site variations but still being able to bring in uh, configuration and new features from a yeah so 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 configuration, configuration management so you know it are you are you expecting to get updates from the distribution so you install your distribution you do some changes to config add That's some right. fields remove some fields and then you know and then version you know, the next point version of the distribution has come out and you want to upgrade for security reasons or get some extra features, and at the same how time does that preserve, those preserve your configuration features? That yeah. Um, we haven't made any firm decisions on any of that yet. Um, you know, this is early discovery phase. Looking at Thunder and talking to Thunder, they have some interesting stuff on there. I think there's some, I mean, Phil, maybe you've got some config management. Uh, 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 there's a, something called config diff updater or something like that, or config update config helper. Config distro, which config. promises to allow for that. I haven't worked with it. Before. So there's something that, I, as I understand it, it looks at the diff between config and helps you deploy update hooks to change config on places where you might do not just want to import the config blind, but you exactly. basically, you know, if the change is to add a new field, then it will bring in that additional field without overriding your config. Mm. But I haven't looked into the technicalities yeah. of that. You can but. write update hooks to change your config. Yeah. And then Apply those update hooks into the thing. But we've had the same problem with Lightning, like, like they'll update Lightning and that will break the config because it's expecting something that isn't in the config. Yeah. Um, and and, yeah, and, and there are these questions, right, about how is the distribution meant to be used? Is it meant to be installed and then you just kind of carry on and go off and, and you'd update core and you'd update any kind of com, um, contrib modules that are involved, but you would never update the actual install profile and expect that to happen. So essentially, you, it's the starter kit, and off you go. That's one way a distribution can work. And some distributions are meant to be that, right? And then other distributions are kind of like open social, it's like, it does everything, right? And like, when, you, you know, when there's a security release or something else, which may be in the, in the, in the distribution, or maybe in core or contrib, then you need to update that whole distribution, and that's where this problem comes in, right? And uh, yeah, I think it's not an easy one to solve. I think but, there was comments that profiles could take on um, like themes, have, be, have a base profile, and then um, you can have it. You can have your own profile, which is based upon another profile. Okay, so like inheritance, yeah, around. inheriting, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So sort of child so, profiles. Yes, that's how Lightning tries to do it, but it often has to pack Drupal to get that working properly. Uh, yeah, and that, that sometimes doesn't quite work. Yeah, like, from experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And then there's a, there's a discussion around features, right, as well, like how features is used in, in Drupal 8 to enable functionality, but then do we want to be using that to revert configuration still, or you know, no, features, the, the, the modules, sorry, yeah. You should use your, um, 
the, the installer inside the module to install uh, Drupal config as much as possible. Um, probably a bigger discussion about, about how much is in the profile and how much is in the modules. Yeah. But um, you can get modules to install the code when you're doing that. But then, then if you change the config, how do you manage that? I guess that's where features might come in, but I would expect it to be done through um, update hooks. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So avoiding the previous Drupal 7 paradigm of a feature defining lots of functionality, the configuration essentially that it wants to maintain and keep. It's yeah. just configuration in your module that provides a starting point for content types, views, whatever else it may be configuring. Um, and then you kind of move forward from that point. So you can add fields and move fields. Cool. Any more questions? Before, uh, yes. Just on features, uh, open socials had some fun games with features because if you uh, effectively customize an open social distribution and then they update a feature, it breaks it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we've, uh, we've basically it put us back to three months. It's uh, <laughs> destroyed all the config and I couldn't even recover it from the config files. So again, open social features, config changes, causing well, massive problems. To see how the fun the games they're having. Yeah, they're definitely. Yes, that's yeah. the way they're going. They're moving away from features. Right, that's, that's what you were saying. Yeah, that's yeah, probably yeah. why they're moving away from features. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, we're in a much better place in Drupal 8 to be able to deal with these nuances of config changes, yeah. and define how we expect it to happen, and then be clear about that with the consumers of these products, right, of the, of the distribution. Like, be careful if you change on some of this config because that might cause problems. In but if you want to do this, this, or this, then that's going to be fine. But. Yeah, so I renamed just one of the content types and it just broke everything. Yeah, renaming content types and fields, that's going to be <laughs> well, an no, interesting no, just the label. <laughs> okay, just the label, right? Okay. Just the label. Yeah. Yeah. That is what config distro promises to solve. Yeah. Okay. okay. That's just one of them. There was like a half dozen. It was too many. Nobody could. We couldn't, we couldn't basically... Uh, are, we, are, we, are we about time? Is anyone yeah. got any more yeah, questions? I don't want to keep people from their lunch. <laughs> One more question? I might let it, when might there be a code? Yeah. When, when might there be a what? Code. Code? Something, yeah, yeah up yeah. there. Um, yeah, somewhere publicly available. Possibly after the alpha phase, which is probably... <laughs> Uh, well, maybe part of maybe during the alpha phase. Um, so the alpha phase is due to start in April, and so I would expect things to start, you know, maybe materialising in May. But um, to be decided. Yeah. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for coming.